So, hello. <laughs> 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 All right, you're, we're recording. Hey guys. <laughs> uh, this is Tea Time with Tony, and today I'm going to be interviewing my friend and my mentor, Nate Bruin O'Brien. Um, we're going to be talking about business, real estate, and the metaverse. How's it going? This is Bo uh, with Blue Painting. I'm the guy who edits the videos. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, if you notice, before this interview gets started, um, there's a couple minutes of missing footage of Tony actually asking the questions. Uh, it was my mistake. I kind of didn't, the camera wasn't working or something like that. Anyway, stick with it for a couple minutes and then we'll right, be right back to normal. So there's that. Now I'll rewind it back. So we're good? Yeah. We're connected. Okay. Are you going to call me your friend when you introduce me? I'm literally, we're already rolling. So okay. this is probably going to be the intro, I'm guessing, because I've seen Bo's cuts in. Yeah. Am I loud enough? I think so. I can move this closer. Yeah, I just want to make sure. I just don't want to hit it. All right, we'll start talking about complete stuff. If you guys don't mind me picking it, I'll get it. No, it's all good. Am I, am I loud enough? Yeah. I am? Why don't you say something real quick? Test, yeah. test. You guys are solid. Okay. All right, so... Welcome to another show. Uh, this is Tea Time with Tony. This is where we uh, hop on the show. We have some tea here to drink and it sets the mood. I have a bucket full of questions here. I draw the qu the questions at random. I have a guest on my show, um, which I'll let introduce himself here in a second. Um, we're currently drinking Immunity Booster because of the times. We need to keep our immune system strong. Um, so... Without further ado, let's uh, let's jump into some introductions here. So this is, uh, why, why don't you just go ahead and start with your name and then uh, kind of what you do for work and, and a quick fun fact about you and then anything else you want to say. Oh boy. All right. Um, my name is Nate Bruin O'Brien. Um, I am an entrepreneur uh, in the field of repairs and construction. That's how we make our money at least. Uh, and fun fact. I am a uh, second degree black belt. Oh wow! In taekwondo kickboxing, That's really my go to. Yeah, I'm nervous. I couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, and yeah, I'm friends with you. So that's a plus. Yeah, uh, you were in my wedding oh, a month ago. Yeah, two months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, we can hop right into it. Um, I'll draw the first question. Actually, I'll let you draw it. Oh. Audible. Yeah. Here, let me, let me open it though. Okay, so the first question we have here is I don't know if you need help. No, oh, I got it. Um okay, so what is your we're starting we're starting wide here. What is your 10 year goal? Oh gosh. Uh like business goal? Ten just to, yeah, anything. Just what's your ten year target in life? Yeah. Where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? I like that question, but I mean, we got business goals, 10 million in revenue, you know, um, multiple locations. But if I had to like go really wide, I would say financially independent. Uh, and I know that's like cliche, but, you know, not not needing to um, do any work that's repeatable um, by somebody else so that I can focus on doing the things I like and make enough money to support my family uh, and kids doing it. Uh, I think that, you know, I got health goals, but I, I see, I see it being a really like free sort of, um, existence. Mm -hmm. So what do you, when you say do what you'd like to do, what, what would, like, if you think about 10 years, you're financially free. Yeah. Um, you don't have, to, you don't have to work. What would you be doing? With your so time? it's funny. We just, uh, I'm going to the IFA in a couple months and I had to pick like four categories of what's the like, IFA uh, international franchise association. Okay. Um, so they're inviting, invited me to, to come out. Um, we're nominated for, for an award and there's sort of four pillars of business. And one of them was workforce and people. So in 10 years, if I could, you know, what, what would I spend? What the classic question, what would you spend your time doing? If you didn't have to worry about money, it would be the, all the people in my life. So, uh, you know, present for kids, soccer games, hockey, whatever they're doing, if they're into juggling, whatever that is, um, hanging out with doing this stuff, you know, um, coaching the people that 
uh, do work in the businesses that I'm still involved in and really like working with them or, um, you know, building those relationships. So I think most of the time would be spent, uh, you know, in doing reading. I love reading, but most of it would be like present with family, you know, building, building those relationships. What would you, do you feel like you'd miss work at all if you were just, because you're talking about like, that's like complete retirement. I mean, my, no, because my work, I mean, the best part about my work now is working with the people I work with and building their skill. And then there's just all the annoying shit. Like I still have to fucking check the bank balances and do the damn accounting. And you can tell how much I love that stuff. So just like anything that, that I need to, that I would want to get off my plate if I could snap my fingers, I want it off my plate. And ultimately I think that would, you know, that would build the business faster. Um, we just don't have the budget to hire people to do some stuff right now and mm-hmm. falls on, falls on me. You know, I know, you know, so. yeah. Okay. So cool. That's a good, I feel like that's a good 10 year goal. Yeah. Yeah. Fa- I mean, I want to spend, I want to be a really present father. Um, you know, whether we have kids or adopt, obviously you never know. So that's, that's a big one. I had to, I had to sum it up. That's awesome. Yeah, it really is. I feel like, uh, that's where I kind of differ is I I'm like so focused on business and work that I can't imagine having a family. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I just, I feel like when or if I have a family, it's going to be complete accident <laughs> and I'm just, you know, going to fall into it. Not, I'm not a, you know, obviously like I can see the value of having, you know, spending time away from work and, and having a family life, obviously like long term, it, it makes total sense. But um, when I look at 10 years, all I think is business. So it's just interesting to hear a different perspective. Well, that's look, I, I can relate with that. And like, we, I think being an entrepreneur, you have to have some level of obsession with business. Right. But it's funny. One of, one of my mentors, uh, in real estate has two infants and, uh, rather than sort of looking at it as this like dichotomy of business and family and like, Oh, you know, I got to just be present. The way he described it, I thought was just beautiful, but he talked about bringing his kids into his life. Mm -hmm. And so he'll show up at like these, you know, um, black tie events um, and he's got like two kids with him, you know, and he's doing his thing and it's just kind of like, okay, you can have both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we're talking this guy, this guy is wildly by conventional standards successful, but by how I would define success too. I mean, he has it all and he does it all and it's not, it's a, it's beautiful. It's imperfect, but you know, Mm -hmm. he doesn't. The message was you don't have to choose and they can be one and the same. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. So cool. Um, I got my next question here. Don't forget to sip your tea. It's, it's, uh, it's are steeped. We, it's steeped. Yeah. Steep game. Yeah. Steep game is a hundred. Um, <laughs> so this question was, I was hoping would come after another question but it's kind of jumping right into it okay do you plan on jumping into the metaverse and and when i say jumping this question is more so like do you plan on getting into it like and how is more so the question like obviously everybody's talking metaverse right now and it's kind of annoying at how much i i hear about the metaverse but do you plan on getting into it and what have you like how how do you feel like you'll be you'll get into it if you do so I know what question, the follow up question you're talking about. So yes, I plan on getting into it so we can get into what that means from a business perspective, for sure. If you're, if you have a social media account, you are in the metaverse. The difference right now is it's just a screen you're scrolling through. It's two dimensional in a lot of ways. You know, you click into this, this link, this link, this link, and then you get into this page and then you go to this and you click on this hashtag. All the meta, all that's happening from my perspective, in my opinion now, is they are going, let's make this, you know, three dimensional, four dimensional. And um, I think there's going to be people living like separate lives. But so I don't want to get into that. Like, I don't want to lose. And who knows, maybe it'll enhance human connection. You know, maybe you'll be best friends with like a guy in Singapore. I don't think so. Every day. No. No. So I don't know, but it's a little bit scary. Um. I definitely will take advantage of it from a business perspective in any way that I can. Um, Have you looked into that and like how? Yeah. I mean, you can, I think open sea is the big one right now, right? Where you can purchase land or, 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 you know, acquire assets, right? Is that the, yeah. So what I think, uh, I mean, obviously NFTs 
aren't necessarily the the metaverse. Right. But they can live in the metaverse. Like that's the reason why the metaverse is being talked about and NFTs are so similar is because they you can buy an NFT and then display it in the in the metaverse. You can buy land which is an NFT. Okay. You know, that's essentially um the same thing. But I th- like my my thought on that whole thing is like okay, so say you buy land in like it's not like you just buy land in the metaverse, right? There's a lot of different things that are. We were talking about Second Earth. Um, yeah, these little like virtual worlds. They have or... sandbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the, a big one now, right? Yeah, right now. Just didn't Adidas or like Under Armour or something just buy like a shit ton of? Yeah, but see, that's the thing is, I think these companies are just they're placing bets in different ones that seem hot and then they're obviously have enough like clout to make that one be like go up in in like popularity right but i think the problem is is like there's like i could start i could start a, a metaverse, metaverse right and then i could sell you real estate and then i take the money and like it could nothing could come of it and then and i think right now a lot of that is happening so it's hard to i, I don't know i'm not super like like I'm not like trying to jump into it at all costs because I think it's going to cool down and you'll start to see who, and obviously the first movers are going to be the ones that make a lot of money in it. I don't know. That's what I've seen. I, I it's, it's kind of risky to, it's risky to just purchase digital land. When, when I was looking into purchasing digital land, this was like a year ago and I, I couldn't get past the way they had it set up. I don't know. I, I don't know how they have it set up now, but it wasn't through like open sea. It was literally like, you go to Second Earth and you buy it through them, but I couldn't purchase it at the time, so I didn't. But they were expensive even back then. I mean, it's it's like anything, right? So you, you make enough bets, something's going to hit. Uh, I'm a, I'm honestly more interested in how it's going to play a role in our lives. But from a business perspective, I mean, if you put a, if you put five bets in front of me and said, "Hey, will you put a hundred? Here's the five, here's my five picks, Tony's five picks. I've done a little research. I would I would put up to two grand in there right now you know if i was richer i'd put more yeah um i think that's where i mean mean, yeah it's like it's like buying bitcoin in in 2011 yeah yeah it's smart i get it and from a from a personal standpoint or like what it's going to do to the social you know game that we're playing right now i think uh i just think it's so weird to me because like facebook jumped in and as soon as facebook switched their name to meta and and they had that announcement that they're going to change the meta and like the whole world changed to the metaverse it wasn't even something ever being said until right. they until like I, it was a thing before that they weren't the ones who made it up but those sucks yeah but then he he and i think that na- that name change was just more of like they're they're getting in trouble a lot with like they're they're in court a lot and there's a lot of things that they're doing like with privacy that are not that people are not happy about and so they had to do something from a publicity standpoint and i don't know that they wanted to do it and this is just speculation but i don't know that they wanted to do it when they did but they kind of were forced to because of all the bad press they've been getting because i think that it's kind of jumping the gun i don't think that we're going to be in the metaverse even in the next 10 years i don't think i just mm-hmm. knowing i just because i've been like have you put have you worn a v- VR set yeah. before? Yeah, we have one. Okay, so for me, I put it on and I fucking want to throw up right away. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm i not going to be spending any time in the metaverse. <laughs> I'm not going to be throwing up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's messing with your inner ear. I mean, so my dad got me, dad's a super techie, he's a techie guy. So he's like getting the first version of everything. And he gave me the super early version of those headsets. Which, which was... This was, was it Oculus? This was five. It was before Oculus. It was like the was it PlayStation? No, it. I can't remember. I'm and I'm not gonna. But it was about five years ago, and it was crappy. I mean, it looked like it looked like a nineteen early nineteen nineties video game. And a year and a half later, I put one of those things on, and I was like, "Holy shit!" So the rate at which that's improving, I think I'm gonna go ahead and respectfully disagree on the ten years. Um, I think we're looking at like five, but I could be wrong. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I just think that like, I know Facebook is pushing a lot of ads on it, which is kind of funny. Um, I think that was more of like a, okay, we're putting a flag on this. Now let's figure yeah, it out. Yeah, you're like probably they're, they're right. probably behind, but they're they, like, let's be the ones who. You know, yeah, they had to. They right. had to make a move somewhere. Otherwise, somebody else would have. You're probably right with that. I just think that 
and we'll see you're right at the rate at that technology is advancing it's it's exponential so it's not like like, like anything could happen in the next 10 years. So to get back to your question, like I would put, and I said two grand, right? Like uh, f 10 years ago, that would have been 200, right? So I, it's, it's, it's not a insubstantial amount of money, but if I was gonna, I am way more interested in real real estate right now. Uh, okay. And, and nothing I'm going to say about this is like my genius. It's, it's me just staying as close as I can to the people who are experts in this field. Cause I'm not an expert, but um, actually, same guy I mentioned earlier said something to me yesterday, and it was, "You're, you know, anyone who's buying real estate right now is going to look like a genius. Uh, it's a land grab, uh, and it's kind of funny because the same thing's kind of going on in this virtual world, right? So again, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in ten years or five years or whatever it is. Um, but with inflation, uh, it's it's a good place to be. And he's putting his money where his mouth is. I mean, he's buying, you know, th this guy we're talking about is in the apartment world, right? He's buying apartment buildings uh, in Texas, oh, which wow. is a, a fast growing. Um, so in, in terms of like, from a business perspective, if someone was going to ask me advice, I would go, sure, you know, if you got some, some pocket change, or you put away five bucks a week, and you do some digital, uh, but, you know, there's only so much land, and we're not, we're not that close to Mars yet. So it's oh, a, that's a good point. It's a diminishing asset, right? So, um, so that would be where I would I would choose if I had to choose, right? I'd, I'd put it into real real estate right now. That's a good point. Wow. Yeah. I never thought about the fact that that literally land is diminishing. I'm not a fan of real estate because I think it's boring. I'm like, I'm a creative type. And I think like I like commercial real estate because you can get more creative with like what you do with it. And like residential real estate is so boring to me because it's just like <laughs> somebody just lives there. Have you seen the movie Altered Carbon or the show? It's a Netflix I've show. I've seen the first season. Oh. I, so I love that show, but that's like a perfect example. And I think they're interplanetary at that point, right? So there's like other planets. So there is like more land. But I mean, look at what happened when they ran out of space on the ground. Like everything's like building in the sky and they got these floating. That's a good point. Right. So, but just to your point, like it's a, there's, it's just a, you know, it's, it's shrinking and shrinking and therefore, you know, supply goes down. So you don't think we're in a bubble right now? Not at all. No. I think if you if you can in, if you have the opportunity to invest in real estate right now in any way, uh, it's it's a slam dunk. And I've been you know people have been wrong. I shouldn't say I've been wrong. People have been wrong, um, but a lot of the experts agree on this. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a good move. So then, with my question, I texted you about what what do you think about that that property at thirty eighth? Which one? The one you said you were looking at the other day. We're buying it. Really? Yep. Yep. Uh, we're moving forward. The my the, friend was looking at that too, and I was like, eh, I think Nate's probably going to move on it because I looked at it and it looks really good. Oh, really? So you uh, over oh, on Forty Second, right over by the river? Thirty Eighth, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. Which you look, far. He, he looked at it. It was only five days on the market, and he said you already had gone there by the time he saw it because yeah. he saw you on Facebook. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's a. I look at a property like that as a stepping stone for a, a 1031 exchange down the road. Um, cause the, the cash flow is not like super sexy, but, um, again, I don't explain that what that is and why. Sure. And I'm going to butcher this. Cause like, again, I don't pretend to be an expert. I listen to the experts and I, I, I do do some of my own research. So I ran a couple of the, the numbers. There's a couple rules. There's some good, really good short YouTube videos out there on the 1% rule and on the 50% rule. Um, so I won't go into it, but it's a quick sort of rule of thumb on should I look at this or should I not? Uh, and on both of those rules, it was kind of tippy. Um, but the videos that I'm referring to or most videos will also say like it's not a, you know, don't use that as the Bible. And that's where kind of the creativity, it's funny you mentioned creativity, like that's where the creativity comes in, right? So I'm, I'm in construction and um, we have some resources available to us that maybe some investors don't. Uh, and so you got to look at these properties and go, how can I increase value? So what what can I do to this thing to maybe manipulate or change those mm -hmm. numbers in yeah. in real life? So like this one has a secret fi a fifth unit in the basement. In the basement that is not yeah, it's not up to code. So you you technically could live there yourself, yeah. but you and or you could Airbnb it, but yeah. you can't have somebody else live yeah, there. Yeah, we saw an interesting character who was living down there. There's like no windows. Like, I yeah, don't know. It I saw be... pictures of it. Yeah, but you throw an egress in. But so then Minneapolis has these rules around five units. So anyway, our plan would be to combine that with one of the units. Uh, 
And oh, really? Just have like a, a stair set inside? Like a spiral staircase we're, we're thinking about. Um, and Why just, not just Airbnb it? Too much work? I think it's illegal. I think it'd be, it, I don't think it's legal. You should look into it. I, I, I think Airbnb is a lot more flexible than renting because it's short term rentals. So thank you. And uh, we, we, you know, we aren't, we aren't bashing walls down next week. So there, there's a couple schools of thoughts. Like that was one of them. We said we could use it as an office space, um, you know, or, or some other like business front yeah. and again you get you are get, you gonna do uh you're not doing like first time home buyers so you don't have to live there no right it's just what well, you put 20 percent down right right conventional and whatever you do so yeah we, you put 20 percent down um finance the rest you can roll some construction into there if you don't have to do that um i generally don't like to do that uh finance as much of the construction ourselves as we can uh, or get a hard money loan. If you have a good hard money, that's got some negative connotations, but it's actually a really good tool. Um, if you're, if you're expecting to get your return on investment quickly, or you, you expect to be able to pay it back quickly, it, there's some, it's a good tool to use. Uh, it's really great for flips. I got a buddy who did 90 flips this year and he only uses hard money, um, for the construction stuff because they're going to turn it over quickly. What do you mean by hard money? So you can go to, you can go to, people or, uh, you know, there's agencies or organizations or firms that loan out money um, and the interest rates like generally between six and 10 percent, but the payback terms are more aggressive. So you got to pay it back in 12 months or, uh, you know, there, or there's a penalty to pay it back earlier. It's it's uh, and it's I think if you default on that, the penalties are pretty severe. So you got to be you got to have a plan. And so what he'll do is he'll use hard money to acquire a property, meaning like he'll come in and buy a property cash with this hard money. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, cause he can close in a week, he can do it quickly and he's got a relationship with the guy. So the, the firm, you know, trusts you. So it's, it's a different world of banking. You can't go to us bank and go, can I get 25 grand in hard money? Right. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's sort of a different scenario. They look at your track record, you know, your background. It's, it's, it's a little more personal, at least the ones I'm working with. I'm just sharing my experience. Uh, and then you can go to a bank later, three months, six months, and refinance it or you know there's a lot of creative ways but i think that's a big barrier for a lot of people when they get into investing is they're like oh i just i don't have you know 20 grand but there's ways to to get it done you know and that's for the down payment so you can basically take out a loan for the down payment get the down payment to generally and again this is, we're getting into i'm not an expert right but generally um when you get a hard money loan it's for a f generally a flip or something you're expecting to be able to pay back a, you know, on a timetable, a shorter timetable. Um, and you're usually buying, you're usually getting a loan for most of the value of the homes. So you're buying the thing cash, uh, which makes the offer really attractive, right? But you can get into trouble if if you're not, it's not a good plan or it's not a good property or whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how we got on that, but. No, uh, that was good. But yeah, that fourplex I like. Um, again, so getting creative, the numbers are tight and then you go, well, if we add that, but the play on that is what's it worth in five years? And how much equity have I built up? And can I use that and leverage it to go up to an eight unit and then do that three years later, do it again, 30 unit. That's how you get. You so know, you're going to keep that one. Unless you get, unless you're a trust fund baby or you got millions in the bank, that's, that's how it works. I mean, that's how most people who aren't rich, uh, build their portfolio and, and, and grow it and get, get to those. So you think if somebody has money sitting around right now, they should be putting it in real estate. Oh my gosh. If I, uh, yeah, if I, if you gave me 50 million today, um, I would pay off my family's debt and that would cost, I don't know, let's just call it a million and some toys. I'd go 49 million into real estate right now. No question. Wow. You know, maybe save a couple, a couple thousand for, for an NFT or something, you know, <laughs> but I'd put it all in real estate. Interesting. Well, that changes my opinion, I think. Yeah, so let's we'll, go have to talk. we'll have to talk after this. Yeah. All right, cool. Take my money out of the stock market, which is not doing so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so next question here. Yeah. This is good tea, by the way. Yeah, it is. Okay, that one is one that we already talked. So that's the metaverse one that was supposed to come earlier. Are we buying land? Buy land in the metaverse? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> that was just what do you know about the metaverse? You don't want to talk, you're done with the metaverse. Yeah, we already talked. I don't want we're to. About, we're on a real real estate now. Yeah, now I'm more interested in real estate. So. Right. You were so pumped about that at the beginning. They should call it meta state. Instead of, so then we have real estate and then we have meta state. I like it. Uh, coin it, yeah. 
All right, so let me see here. So, okay, this is a good one. So why entrepreneurship? I don't fucking know sometimes, dude. <laughs> I feel the same. Um, <laughs> why entrepreneurship? Uh, that Okay, this one's actually pretty easy. Uh, freedom. Just easy and simple. Kind of back to like the 10-year goal. Like just to be able to do whatever the hell you want. Um, the funny thing about that is like that, that's the picture of entrepreneurship, right? And as you know, like early on, that's not the picture. But I think ultimately that's the answer. Just mm-hmm absolute i can i can do what i feel it's funny like once you once people have the basic necessities for what they need they can start to use the most beautiful part of the human brain which is that frontal lobe and and get creative and really really kind of um built like how do i say this get in touch with who they really are and their being um, but it's sad because we have a hunger problem on this planet. And so people are scraping by just to, just to literally feed themselves. And I think initiatives like education are where people like us, when we start to give back and do our philanthropy, which I know we've talked about as a part of the vision, right. For when you make it, um, but we can do things like that right now, but when people can't eat, they can't think creatively and they can't be free. So it's, it's kind of not cool for us to sit here and go, yeah, you know, because it's like, well, not everybody has that opportunity. But I think ultimately being your own boss is is the key. And then if you can build something big enough to really give back and give that opportunity to people. Mm-hmm. And I think I only think in entrepreneurship, you can do that. You could be a hedge fund manager and make a lot of money and support foundations and blah, blah, blah. But you got to keep being a head fund manager or make enough money to then quit. Right. And there's people who do that. Ray Dalio, huge philanthropist. You yeah. Know, yeah. Made billions. Um, but yeah, freedom and the ability to, to scale and, and give back, I think. is. The... I like that. Yeah. How about you? Why? Uh, why entrepreneurship? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think more so it's like, it probably has to do with freedom. I hate bosses. And I, I hate jobs, I feel like, but not like I, I think it's like, it, like my, like you said, like, it's more so like my brain wants to be creative. It wants to be able to use its creativity. I don't think if I had a boss who let me be as creative as possible, I think I wouldn't be drawn to, I don't, it's like a, a punishment to be an entrepreneur sometimes. So like, it's not necessarily something I love it and I like the challenges and I like challenging myself, but I don't see it as being necessarily super free um at the end of the day it's like you're you're you have like okay as if you're a solopreneur i think that's more free even though you have to like work to make money um as soon as you start hiring employees yes you can be more free with your time but like you're there's going to be things that pull you back into the business it's something i talked about on an earlier episode it's like you you're going to be forced to do something when you don't want to do it you know what I mean? So it's like not necessarily free. Like you could have like a family thing planned, right? A week vacation. And then something could happen in your business where you literally cannot leave the business or your business will not no longer be there when you get back. That can happen. And it doesn't matter what stage you're at. I think obviously if you can grow a business where you have like 100 employees under you, then there's less likely that you're going to have to get pulled away. But I, I've found that the more employees you start hiring, the the more like you're needed. And I, it depends on how good you are at delegation. And there's a lot of things you you got to learn. But I think freedom is the illusion that of an entrepreneur at the beginning. Okay. I totally agree at the beginning, right? And you could you could be one of those people, like I think Tim Ferriss made a, started a business, right? That was like, it, it was literally built off AI. Like he didn't have to do a lot at a certain point. His supplement company, I could be wrong about built up that. AI, but yes. Okay, but he didn't have to do that. He right? was able to escape the nine to five and join the life of the new rich or whatever his book sure. says. But there's a lot of people who say that book was a book. Sure. And that he didn't actually like they, they like he wrote a really good book. So we have to we have to define freedom first, right? So what is freedom? Okay. I like working with my people as long as they're the good ones, right? Because you, you're gonna especially as you grow, you're just gonna get people who are average or don't, you know, have the company's best interest in mind, they have their best interest in mind. But I I mean, you, you've read good to great, right? Yeah. So like these companies, 
yes, it's initial work for sure. But you look at the leaders who drive the culture and build the culture, it becomes this organism. So the way you're the way you're describing it is sort of like this top down structure that depends on the Apple is a perfect example of it. Now, maybe maybe Steve Jobs is going to prove me wrong here from the grade, but from the grave, but Apple was based on a genius, a single leader mm -hmm. who had really good, smart helpers, but he was the innovator. He went now they're doing some new stuff. I don't know. We'll see where Apple's at in 50 years. I think that'll really. I could disagree with Apple. Tell the story. I think I understand why you'd say that, but Tim, Tim Cook is an amazing operator. And I think that that was what rang Apple. It's not. That like, may be. Steve Jobs might have been the. I think Steve Jobs, could, financially, he might have harmed Apple more. Like he made it more innovative and stuff. But I think once Tim Cook took over, like they actually, their financials got better because he's that an idea be, guy. He that runs may be with true. ideas. Sure, sure. I guess what I'm getting at is when you, when you build a good enough culture in a business, it becomes an organism that, sure, maybe you were the catalyst, but you can't say that, you can't say that the, you know, uh, the first cell that started the first plant um, is is the only reason that you and I are alive right now. And if it, you know, and and wherever that cell is right now, if it like it doesn't matter where that cell is right now, right? Like I see. So you build the organ, you build the organism, and then it runs itself. You have to think about it like an organism, right? And you're 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 starting out as the single cell. You're building cells around you. You're 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 part of the infrastructure at first. You're doing. You are the mitochondria and then you are the ribosomes and then you build a ribosome and then you build this and you build that and then fine, maybe there's a nucleus, right? But then you create a system that hires new nuclei on uh, however long people are of the nucleus or the president or the CEO, a really good hiring and recruiting system and organism, right? So there's all these little mini organisms that run the, the important parts and mm -hmm. then you come out of the cell and the thing just evolves on its own you know yeah. i mean i would be like it, that sounds really nice right but there's examples of it in real life walgreens is an example um you know it that's a great book by the way good to great really uh, yeah. yeah if your listeners need something to read. i'd like to point something out biology major here <laughs> <laughs> just used to sorry a get bunch of terminology <laughs> and nobody knows <laughs> unless they're maybe it was, you know uh the a house right you no need, no it was good I, I, okay. I, I got it no that that made sense uh but no yeah i i agree i think you can get a company but you're not talking about entrepreneurship anymore when you're talking about walgreens you're talking about a corporation that is run by like the founder is not anywhere near Walgreens, the founding family maybe is tied in still somewhere financially. Sure. So, but again, back to freedom, right? So yeah, something can always happen. But if that's your mindset, at least, like maybe you're a solopreneur and you don't want to build an empire, like you want to be an entrepreneur and you, you know, you're okay with getting pulled into the business once a month. There's a lot you can do in your business. People can do. I heard a guy in the gym this morning running a construction company. He's like, we would, you know, we would build more decks, but I just have to be there. And I'm in my, you know, I'm not going to give the guy advice in the sauna, but I'm going to go, well, you could, you could teach somebody that. Right? Did you say it to him? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I got his number and said, can I send you my big job? I don't want him. Um, but, but my point is, is if that's the mindset, uh, sure, maybe you're never totally free, but I think that's how you lean, right? Yeah. To freedom. Right? Yeah. And if you love what you're doing, then. That's what I, yeah. I think that you have to love it. I, th I think, I guess like. I guess my point is, is that if you go into it thinking that I'm going to build a passive stream of income, um, you should be in real estate. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I just don't think you'll make it to building up anything passive because it takes too much hands on work to get to passive. If that's like the, the if that's what you want to do. Sure. Well, so when you say like freedom, that's like the goal when you jump into it. But in all reality, if you're the type of person who's going to build a successful business, like you have to become obsessed with it, which is again then you're which you're not work i don't consider working so it's not like you're a slave to the work but but you aren't it's not like i'm going to the beach every day and able so to that so there chill. it is right like freedom might mean when people hear that they're like yeah i want to be able to go to the beach every day for for me freedom is i want to i love my work i absolutely love entrepreneurship you could give me any business and you know as long as it's ethical like i would love to figure out how it works what's fun for me is getting to a point where I get to ch everything I do in my day, I get to choose what I'm doing because it's what I like most about 
yeah. the work, right? I want to mm-hmm. be able to bring my kids to the job site, talk to my guy, take them out to lunch. Then maybe we do go to the beach for two hours and then we go. But I, it's, I'll tell you what, it's not going to be as, okay, now go play in the corner because dad's got to do QuickBooks, you know? like <laughs> so, so being able to really dictate what you do mm-hmm. in, in a given day for me is what freedom is, right? So, and I think, yeah, I get it. I think there's some jobs that also give you that too. Because what are you going to do? I mean, how... Maybe there's some people out there who really are happy golfing all day, going to the beach all day, and that's their life. I would go nuts, you know? Yeah. But if you want to do that, buy real estate, hire a property manager, you know, work hard for five years and live off 10 grand a month. You'll be fine. You yeah. Know, live in one of your properties for free. Yeah. And then you can golf and, and do that all day. I feel like it would just be, there wouldn't be enough going on. Like it'd be too stagnant i'd find so many i'd there'd be so many issues like i'd make issues out of nothing like oh, this club sucks I'd, you know, like because they're i have to be solving a problem at all times so, like it's hard to imagine just complete complete like retirement just sounds completely so i don't know if you like are editing this later and i don't remember we'll look up the quote later but the quote's like maybe it's thoreau or something but it's like um man and what he means is mankind back there right man needs problems like man's man's greatest gift are the problems he has, something like that. So mm-hmm. look, that, look that quote up. But we should your, look that up. To your put point. it on there. Yeah, throw it on the bottom or something. Yeah, yeah. Thoreau. I, I, I don't. Yeah. don't, quote, I don't is think, it not Thoreau? You don't. Even I don't know. Thoreau. What it is. Don't write down Thoreau. No. <laughs> Just well, write it down because if I'm right, I want I want the credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's do the next one. Uh, this is interesting. So, how did you get into house flipping? And what's your advice for someone looking to get into real estate? Let's start with the first one. How did you get into house flipping? Real estate. Yeah. What was the first one? Um, it was Bible. Yep. So construction, got into construction because of painting with you. So we were in painting. We wanted more customers. Pretty, you know, 22 year old mindset, like make more money, make more money, right? Get customers to use this four times a year. Got into construction. Knew I wanted to get into real estate. Didn't know how I was going to do it. Do it, you know. Started to kind of look for flips, talk to experts. Um, found one because we were doing an estimate, and just again thinking about it every day, top of mind, top of mind. Finally, this going in to do sales when I did sales then, and I was going to sell a remodel. These people had called me in to to do an estimate to remodel their whole condo. Um, son had you know drug addiction, lived there, just trashed the place, and. They were just devastated, wanted to get rid of it. So motivated. Um, and they're like, and, and I just said out of nowhere, like, well, would you sell it to me? Right. No money, like in crazy debt from starting the business early, early on. Um, no plan, nothing, but ask the question. Um, and then just problem solved after that. So that was the first one. Did it, learned a bunch, got addicted. Um, I think that was 20, 2017, 2018 winter. So three years ago now, um, done nine cents, one with you. Um, and, uh, and the second part was, I think the advice, right? Yeah. So the second part is, that's not the question. Yeah. So it's, what would you tell, what, what advice would you give somebody who is looking to get into real estate? Cause there's a lot of younger people out there who are seeing that real estate is the thing. And like you said, people are kind of hesitant because they don't have down payments and stuff. What would you like, if somebody was, maybe 18 years old and they wanted to get into real estate, what, what, where would you, what direction would you put them in? I, so I'll, I'll start super high level and do a couple, couple more red meat. The, the high level is pretty simple. Do it with a partner who's done it. I think that is the, f- the fastest way to get into it. Um, what I see a lot of younger people do, or just people who are trying to get into it, you know, they've had their day job for 10 years and they, they want financial freedom. Um, but they'll, they'll just overanalyze. They're just paralysis by analysis. So they'll, they'll run the numbers and run the numbers and not good enough. And then, well, what if the tenant, and they'll just go through all these scenarios. And I, I'm did that and was guilty of it. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. And I was, I've mentioned this guy a couple of times. I won't say his name because we don't have permission, but I was just like appalled when I was like, Hey, I want to get into something. Can I, and he's like, yeah, let's buy this. Yep. We'll do it. Yep. It'll cash flow fine well, what about, no, it's fine. We'll buy it. And I'm just like, okay, but what about, he's like, no, I, I, no cracks in the foundation. Furnace is a little old, but whatever. So I was just like, like this guy's fearless. What the hell? Right. And 
And now I'm getting the opportunity to do that with, with other people now. Right. So my advice, number one, just find somebody who's done it. Like don't reinvent the wheel. Don't, what does that look like? Like, okay, you find somebody who's done it. What, how do you go to that person? How do you like, what do you pitch to them? How do you, how, how exactly does that deal work? So usually people who are, who have done this and are, and pick someone who's done it successfully, right. Or at least made enough mistakes to where they're, they have some successful deals going on now. Cause there's a lot of, don't do it with somebody you don't know, right. Get a referral, whatever. Um, go to them and go, Hey, listen, I want to get into this. I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to do all the bullshit is with your guidance. Right. Um, I got 10 grand. Can I do a deal with you? Uh, it doesn't need to be today. It doesn't need to be tomorrow, but will you keep me in mind? Can I buy you coffee? Can I buy you lunch? I'll, I'll do everything you tell me to do. Um, I know you love Gary V references, but right. Like he's like, if I were, if I was an aspiring artist, I would go to Jay-Z's house or, or business or whatever, call, you know, his assistants firm, call him up and say, I'll work for free for a year. Right. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's a legit, well, how do I work for free? I can't like figure it out. Right. Keep your day job. You have 16 hours and every day, if you want to get eight hours of sleep, figure mm -hmm. it out and do whatever it takes mm -hmm. and just do that for one deal in, and, and don't expect to make any money. If you're, wor if you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to make 10 grand on the deal, just assume you're going to lose money and, and do it for the learning. And you'll be pleasantly surprised when, if you pick the right person that you'll do well, but just go to them and do that like 10 times, do that with 10 people and follow up with them. Right. Cause when I'm looking at stuff, I'm going, Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm 10 grand. Oh, you know what that I've heard from Tony 10 times this, you know, over the last three months, I'll call him. He's probably got 10 grand. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And again, you got to be careful with that. Like don't, don't pick people you don't know or that don't have a track record. So then my next question is, would you be willing to people who are watching this? Would you be willing to do a deal with them? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, in fact, so what my, what a good friend of mine and I always talk about is like our long-term vision is similar to what, uh, if you look at what Grant Cardone's doing, you know, a capital yeah. fund, um, we're, we have opportunity for that now. Uh, in the return's not insane, right? It's not, uh, it's not super attractive, but you got to get your feet wet. I remember I asked one of my mentors once, I'm looking at this condo. I don't know. Should I? He's like, you got to get in the game somehow and you don't do it by analyzing, looking at numbers, get close to the people who are doing it. Um, you know, there's going to be some trust there and just get in the game. Right. And uh, it, it, even if you have five grand, like fine, invest it in the construction, your return might not be great. And the deal might be, yeah, you got to give me five grand and you got to be on site every day for an hour so you can learn and you got to help or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. Like there's some sweat built into it and then you get to make money on this deal. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's like, I don't want your five grand, but if it's for the relationship and you get close to it and now we've built some trust that can, I mean, that's exactly how I I'm in, I'm in a deal in Texas now. It's a 49 unit apartment building. Um, and it's a syndication. So there's like three, what they call general partners and like seven, can't remember the term for them. Um, but they went and bought this building and they're doing exactly what, what you're describing on, on just a bigger scale, right? It's like a 50,000 minimum investment. You don't have to do shit. Um, they got them at like 70 bucks a door. Uh, Texas is just booming. Right. Uh, and they're, they're bringing their own money. So it's not like they're taking everybody's money and you know, there's no risk, like their skins in the game. And I'm watching them because they, they're at like 600 units, uh, Wow. as a team or more so do they just buy them and rent them out then and then you just so the or do play they buy on, and flip them yeah so the play on this particular deal is they're they're buying it um they're renovating it and then renting it and then five to seven is the target where they'll resell it and the value will just be um you know the the numbers they're putting out there are pretty conservative but I think they're not showing their cards. I think they think it's more than they're sharing with their investors, which is good business practice, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to overhype people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, back to your kind of the original point, like 100%, anybody watching, call me up, throw my cell phone number or something on the bottom. Um, that's, that's how you get in. That's how you get it. And, but if you're, if you're worried about making a bunch of money, just don't get into real estate. Like you, you got to get dragged through the mud, just do it with somebody who knows what's going on. Yeah. So, so you, you get bruised, you're not, you know, you don't lose an arm.
right? Yeah. So the goal is if you're going to try to get into it, build like the goal should be to build a portfolio or get the experience to then keep doing it. It's not about the first deal. It's about the next 10 deals. Exactly. I, like I joke like I and, and but there's some truth to this. I never want to do a deal alone again, like ever. Like I always want to have a partner. Um, one, because again, from early in our conversation, it really is about the relationship. Doesn't matter what you have in the bank account, right? When you die. Uh, but it's fun and and you can share that experience with somebody. And I'm passionate about teaching, so I get an opportunity to do that too. And your your capacity is just so much bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Like oh, if you're trying to do it all alone and money grab and scrape every dollar out of everything, like you can do that and people do that and build a nice little portfolio. But I want to get big. And the only way to do that is with the the best thing on this earth, which is, uh, you know, the other humans that yeah, you can work yeah. with, right? Cool. I'll have to do a deal with you again here. Soon. Are you ready? Let's go. I'm ready. I got one. We're looking at one. The 38th Street? In Richfield. No. Uh, no. You're... Where in Richfield? I can't remember. I'll send it to you. Is it a duplex? No, it's a single family. Oh. I, I like these little single families. I want to get into, if I'm going to actually be the one on the loan anyways, I want to get into... A uh, fourplexer. I feel like getting into anything less for your first one, first time home buyers. I feel like it makes sense to get into a fourplex. There's there's good fourplex. data for both, and depending on your scenario, like you know, I mean, just being a landlord for years is a good experience, even if it is a single family. You know, yeah. You lose a renter in a single family, though. You know, you're you you don't have another door cash flowing. We just yeah. lost a renter in a single family, so really, yeah. But you know that's part of the game. And There's got to be a lot of people renting right now, though, right? There is, yeah, yeah. She, had, you know, this person had um, some sad circumstances, but um, but that's part of the game. It's good, good to good for learning, you know. Okay, let's do a change of pace here. I grabbed cool. a I grabbed a white question. Mm -hmm. There's we have yellow ones and we have white ones. This one's a white one. So it means it's an it's the yellows are the ones that we wrote today. The white ones are from earlier. So this one uh, is probably off Facebook. Um, it's how do you do your promotion and marketing in your business? All right. No, I'm just kidding. I know. It's uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of, it is boring. Um, so there's actually an aspect of this that I really like, and it's it's like digging into the data. So like really looking at what's paying you. Um, so when we first started, it was pretty much try everything. Uh, not so, you know, you got to have a, a budget and a plan um, and it's good to do some research again I, I go back to this find the find the people who are doing it well we have the luxury of being part of a franchise system so I can look uh, I was able to when we first started and I'm just using handyman connection as a you know as a subject here but this is true with any business I could look at other businesses that were doing a million let's call it like okay my first step is a want to get to a million in revenue I can just look and study what they were doing right so that's key. Um, what are other people doing in your industry that works? And you could do, if you're, let's say you're starting a, a printing company, printing business cards for people, like call a printing company and go, can I, would I be able to just sit down, you know, sales rep, can I sit down and just ask you guys about your marketing? I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm learning about, and most of the time people like, you know, sharing that. Especially stuff. if you get the, like the entrepreneur or the business owner, they'll want to talk about it all day. I am like the king of being lazy when it comes to learning stuff. Like, Every once in a while, I'll learn an actual skill on YouTube. Like I'll Google it and I get nerdy about some stuff and like some stuff. But, you know, I, I always I always go back to like how, especially being a man, like there's like this stigma against asking for directions or like asking where something is in Home Depot. I am like the king of like to the point where I almost kind of like being annoying. Like it's some tick. Like a lot of men especially don't want to ask or don't want to do this or just someone who's got a lot of pride i'll go right in there and go can you show me where the pickles are like i could literally look up and go through the sign and like, you said never aisle nine i will aisle never nine. i will I, never why i compounded over time you just the reason why is because i i don't like talking to people who are incompetent and sometimes i land on somebody who's like well let me see here and then it's just like but I'm just like, it, Jesus, I, I I could do it. I just hate knowing that I could do something better and I'm I'm listening to this other person do it. And it's like, it just hate, I hate it. So I right. like, I will avoid even, I don't even want to look at people when I go into a store. I know I go within with people sometimes and they'll be like, I'll be like, oh, okay, we just got to go find this. I'll be with somebody. And, and, and then they just turn and are like, hey, do you know where this is? And I'm like, oh my God, dude. Like, <laughs> just like, like now we're stuck super uncomfortable. Like, 
All right. Well, we can do a, a grocery store bit some other time. I'll, we'll each have a grocery list and we'll time each other and see who gets it done faster, right? So the goal is get the answer and get it executed because the goal is a million, see, right? Yeah. So anything else that's taking away from time to get there is a waste of your time. I know. Right? And I live in T-Dots, which we won't get into, but oh I live gosh. in a different timing system. Doing your fucking timing. Psychological time. And like to me, like... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I gotta go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So to me, like, I don't know. I we're not even get into that. Fine, fine. Back to marketing and promotion. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so steal everything, right? Um, and then just be a data junkie and look at the data. Trust the data. Look at the data again. Keep that in front of you all day long. Um, if you want like some actual tactics, I mean, you can buy leads online for almost any industry. You know, you can, you know, Facebook marketing's. Yeah, free. I think tactics, though, I like the big picture. So like you're yeah. saying, basically, always have the numbers in front of you. And you're talking like the cost of it, the cost of each lead source. So how much you're spending on the lead source, and then your what your return is on each lead source. So tracking the data first is like the first step is making sure you have a system ready to track it and then start spending money, obviously get like figure out from other people what they're doing, start spending money, and then go back and and just make sure that the numbers add up. So high level, so it's it's about triangulate between people who know what they're talking about and your actual data and feedback. And if you're just starting out, you're not going to have a lot of data and feedback. So you got to go look at other data and feedback, right? So it's kind of, a, it's a triangle. You use that, you use people who know what they're doing and then have a budget in mind and maximize that budget to identify first all of the things you can do that don't cost you any money, that just cost you time. Mm -hmm. That's where I would start. And then between those three things, it's just a matter of like, you know, shake iteration, it, shake and sand out. Of, exactly. Iterate, yeah. iterate, iterate. Um, but Ray Dalio is a huge triangulation fan. Quick story just to bring it all home. Got diagnosed with cancer. Mr. Dalio did. Started planning for his death. Went to another doctor, said, you don't have cancer. Um, and he's like, OK. Made them talk to each other. They wouldn't get to the truth because they wanted to respect each other's opinions. Got a third doctor involved. And it was some like thing that was, yes, it was cancer, but it had to be removed. So point being is like people will ask someone something, get an answer and go, OK, it's like triangulate, take the time, find the experts, sometimes get them on the phone with each other. Right. Well, what do you think about you said this? You said this. Can you guys debate about this? Right. But a lot of people just don't there. It, it makes them uncomfortable. They don't like that conflict. But if the truth is what matters in this case, like feeding your family with your business. Right. Remind yourself of that and push through and use your numbers, use people who know what they're talking about, and then just understand there's a level of risk associated with this always. So mm -hmm. you've got to be willing to to lose some money and, and make sure you're okay, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. The Ray Dalio story. Yeah. Is yeah. that a book? Is there a certain book that's out of? He just came out with another new book. I'm in the middle of reading, but... Um, sort of considered like the business Bible. It's called Principles by Ray Dalio. Principles. I'm a listener. So, uh, but if you're a reader, he's got a lot of good like charts and graphs, but it's very, like the first chapter is about like evolution, you know, mm -hmm. but he brings it down to business in just the most beautiful, elegant way. I mean, cool. he's a brilliant guy. We'll link, we'll link the book or put a picture of it or yeah, something. Check that one out for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's hop into another question here. What time do we got? Okay, we'll we'll do a couple couple more, maybe one, maybe two. I think it's a good one. Okay, this is this is a good one. Okay, so okay, so what have you learned from running? What have you learned from running a franchise for all these years? So you've run a franchise for 12 years. You've been in, in the franchise system, 12, 13 years. What have you learned um, specifically from like running? You, you just mentioned some, some like positives of running a franchise, but what have you learned? Oh man, that's open-ended. Um, Very open-ended. I, I think just give, give us like the, the high points. Um, I've learned that... Uh, People are the most important thing on any in any organization. Uh, I don't care if you run a back to Ray Dalio investment firm that uses algorithms and artificial intelligence to make um, investment decisions. 
Uh, I don't care how automated your business can be. Any people, and maybe it's not even your employees. Maybe it's the key relationships, right? The the guy who sells you your card stock for your paper business, or whatever it is, your paint vendors. Um, there are always individuals associated with these organizations or organisms, if we're going with, with sort of that theme, right? That are the most important thing, right? I don't, I didn't use Sherwin Williams, um, plug in Sherwin Williams here. I didn't use Sherwin Williams because they had super superior paint. I had a manager at that store that helped me out and answered all the questions that I had. You remember Aaron? Aaron? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just the, the boss, He's right? the best. Yeah, I can't believe they let him go. When you look at really great organizations, there's nothing intrinsically great about the organization or the office. When, when you go, what what makes this so great? You figure it out by spending time in that organization and talking to the people or the people associated with it or the partners associated with it. So if I had to really just as high level as I could, I'm coming back to this theme. People are the most important thing in, in any organization. Treat them right. Pick the right ones, right? Like I'm an over, overly empath, so I've definitely invested way too much time in people that I shouldn't have, you know? Um, but when you get the good ones, make them a priority. Let other bad shit even happen. Take care of them. They'll take care of you when the bad shit happens, right? And then a lot about myself. You know, I think, it, I think that when you stick with something for an extended period of time, it provides a platform of consistency for you to really grow, right? Like athletes talk about, you know, all the lessons that basketball taught them and none of them have to do with basketball, but kind of creating, that's why I think it's so great for kids to, to provide some level of stability and structure because it, it creates an arena for them to kind of go through that iterative process with whatever it is, right? But then they, they bump up in, against their own weaknesses and their own, um, you know, uh, inefficiencies or whatever it is, and it allows them to be exposed to themselves and people either quit or they find ways around them or they partner with people who complement their weaknesses and build relationships that way. But um, so people and then just choosing something and really going, going into it, right? Like just because you pick, you choose to be a real estate agent, I don't think means you have to be a real estate agent your whole life or even for five years. But say, I'm going to do this for a year and I'm going to really give it my all and I'm not going to quit no matter how hard it gets. And even if I don't make a lot of money, or I'm not successful. I'm going to try my best. And in that process, you may decide after a year or six months or whatever it is, right? Don't do a week. Nobody, you know, I think three months is kind of the habit forming period. So I'd say that's a minimum, but maybe it's different for other industries, but pick a timeline and stick to something. Mm -hmm. And you'll, worst case, I think you'll come out and learn learn a lot about yourself that you can take and bring that to, to your next venture so yeah would you say with like franchises because that you've you've ran a couple now um like you there's a lot of coaching that goes on in franchises and like do you feel like that's a big value proposition of running a franchise having like somebody who can be your coach whereas like a lot of people who start a company they don't necessarily have a mentor they don't know how to find a mentor they're just in a vacuum a lot of times yeah. So like again, I'm like the the king of laziness, right? So I I like franchising cuz I can take something that already is working on some level and then just make it way better. Um and in terms of the support, yeah, like I look at franchising as as kind of speeding up the process from mm -hmm. as opposed I, I have such respect for people in startups, you cuz you know, you 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 have to just invent everything, right? And you're it's like you're like it's it's like being it's kind of like the difference between coming out of the womb and figuring stuff out versus like getting to start at like age four. Like, OK, you already know how to walk. You're not you know, you don't have to figure that out. You don't have to. There's there's just some fundamentals that are yeah. sort of handled for you. Mm -hmm. Now, you pay for that on the back end if you stay long enough. Right. But yeah, um, in terms of the coaching, I don't know that that's the case in every franchise system. I know the ones that I've been in specifically that's a core value and that that has paid for my royalties alone for sure yeah and you can i mean you can seek a coach out you 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 hire coaches so you can yeah. do that you don't have to be in a franchise system yeah no i just know i'm just curious because i know obviously i know some of your yeah. your gms and stuff like that but i do want to touch on something that's interesting is you said you can take a franchise and then you can make it better and i think that's something that's it's interesting to touch on because people think that a franchise and a lot some of them are like very 
cookie cutter this is how it is but there's Those are usually the, the most successful ones too right? well but i think that there is something to say that you can pick up like in a franchise there is some flexibilities to do things your own way it's not like you ha- when you, it's not like you just have a job in a franchise like you do have some say in how the business is run who you hire stuff like that so i don't know i i thought that was interesting what i learned anyways about your the different franchises you've had is that like you do have a lot of um like you can do things differently here and there. You can find new things. Obviously, like you said, like McDonald's learned that they, if they sell burgers and fries, like it's better than if they try to sell chicken, like in the early days, it's like, that was not a good idea. And they were trying, like the the franchisees were trying to do whatever they wanted. But, but I think there is something about somebody who's looking for a franchise to know that like, when you get in there, like you will be able to still geek out and make it the best running machine that you can. Yeah, and it's in the best interest of a franchisor for people to come in and do that, right? And I'm not romantic about franchises, but yes, there's definitely a level of freedom. And I think if a franchisor is smart um, and open-minded and good, those are the people who want to come in and innovate are the people that they should be hiring as owners, right? Now, you can't be – you have to follow your FDD or whatever, right? But I have a good relationship with my franchisor, and we're doing a lot of stuff differently, and we're – bumping up against first in the country for revenue and going to be up there in profit next year too. Um, And we totally spun our wheels on a lot of things that maybe had we listened to the advice we got from the franchisor, we would have figured out sooner, but that's part of that iterative process. And Mm -hmm. I think, I think the misconception with franchises is people come in and go, okay, I'm buying a passive investment. Like you are not buying a passive investment. Like if there are people involved in this, in this business you're buying, like unless you are buying a widget that kicks out, I'm trying to think of something that's even analogous to this. I guess real estate is probably the closest you thing. You could get to maybe like on something like a website, something that, that yeah. doesn't, that is like more passive on a website. Or a company that's already established running and, but you're going to pay a lot of money for that, right? So if you, if you can, I mean, a perfect example is a guy in our system bought a, a franchise that was doing $2 million, It was profitable. He bought it and it is not doing well. And so it, it doesn't just because you buy something that's working. Uh, if there's people involved and you want something passive, like you are, you need to be an entrepreneur. So my point was to bring that home is the misconception with franchises is people buy them and go, well, they're just going to do every, they're going to do everything. I just have to do everything they, they tell me to do. And I, I know personally some owners in our system that have that mindset and they're not doing well. Like you you still have to be an entrepreneur. You know, you can't, you can't buy anything in this world. Again, maybe a website, right. That that's just going to kick out cash and and you don't have to think or innovate or or be an entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. Um, If you're a good manager, maybe you're not an entrepreneur, but if you're a good manager and you buy into a really good system, um, that could be a good fit, you know? Uh, if it's a really successful model already, right? mm-hmm. I think of McDonald's, I think of, you know, Jersey Mike's, like, I really like that, that franchise, um, construction's definitely not like that. You know, that is a, yeah, we can tell you what to do, but you better be good with people or you're going to fail. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's why it's funny. The franchise, like the way all construction, well, at least the ones that I know about that, like more home service or construction franchises, it's like. They give you rough systems, but it's like there's no way for them to guarantee this is going to happen on there, every job. Yeah, there's no way to teach you what to do when you're driving down the street, your painter falls off a roof, you get another call that someone's suing you, and um, somebody like ran over a neighbor's dog. I don't know if I say it online. Right? <laughs> it's never happened to me. Um, but like you, you can't train somebody for the shit that happens in home in the home yeah, service yeah, industry. Yeah. Um, so you there's too many variables. You got to be brave to be in that industry, but it's it's such a at the same time it's one of those it it's an industry that's in my opinion not going away no matter how big the metaverse gets right no. like they are not going to make houses that repair themselves in our lifetime and even if they do people are going to want that gazebo built yeah and they're back it's custom and you know yeah i have some ideas for like painting robots that i've been building um that you could you could i mean rough idea that i have is like a robot that you can set up that will paint your house for you by just clicking a button because it could scan the whole house and then if it's set up on tracks like it could just you know it could even do the scraping and sanding all that stuff sounds crazy people are gonna think i'm crazy but i'm not i'm not kidding like the 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 mechanics are there it it can happen 
It's just, is it worth the money, the investment to make it happen? So that's, you know, it, when you say, I know I've thought about it before, like, can they just make the color of a house change? But like, you'll never, painting will not, I feel like never go away. And same with construction. Like they'll just, there's never going to be a time you're not going to need. And it, it might change. Like there might be things that change, like new materials come out and right. stuff, but you just learn how to use those materials. And then. I just don't think human connection will ever go away. No. You know? There was some research done actually recently, and I think I think it was a, a third party firm that our company hired. Um, yes, it, it's actually our new call center. Uh, they talked about like the difference in response rates and close rates on customers that had a phone conversation um, with the company before hiring the service and ones that inquired online or through a text or an email or whatever. And it was just like a stat. Like I thought it'd be, you know, a little a little sway, but it was like 70, 30 or something. And again, I don't. Don't ask me exactly That's the crazy. metrics, but in their call center. So, maybe, you know, maybe they're a little biased, but they're saying how important human connection still is, especially in the home service industry where we are in their home. Yeah. Like this is their personal space. Yeah. You know, I found that too. Yeah. People want to talk to somebody. They want to get answers. It's mm. a very personal business. Big communication for us is like the biggest, the the biggest thing. I mean, that's because people want, they want to talk to somebody who has the answers. They don't want a message. They don't want, you know an alert. So, yeah. um, I'm going to ask one more here. Cool. Hopefully it's a good one. Probably one of those shitty ones you read earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Okay. This is the one I wanted. That's awesome. Wow, that's crazy. How the universe, the metaverse works. <laughs> this is the metaverse actually guys. Oh really? Yeah. We're in it. I didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah. You don't. Nobody does. Um, okay. So how do you stay focused through the ups and downs? We're coming out with a new matrix. Did you know that? Is that how you stay focused? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. But I thought is, that would play nicely with a focus question. That's the right timing though. <laughs> of course they are. Yeah. They're just trying to make that extra. Yeah. And we're in it. They're, the metrics. We didn't know it. They've been filming, filming it for the last 10 years. How do I stay focused through the ups and downs? Um, yeah. First off, the thing yep. that I feel like I envy about you is because i know you really well is that you are a focused person like you come in here and you're looking at the clock like it hits 11 he's like it's 11 01 it's like I, that is so far from my head like i don't care what time it is you know but like you're you stay you stay focused and i've always had a problem my focus all especially through the seasons we get slow and it's hard to be focused when it's like extremely slow how do you like how do you stay focused on what you're doing your your goals your five-year ten-year goal your your real estate your company um how do you stay focused on that stuff through the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows so we did a team health building exercise uh you you do these with eos um with my team and i did not score well on focus so just as a as a precursor that, interesting that being said though um when i managed to achieve focus there's a couple big things. One, I learned this from a guy. I do a lot of like self-development stuff. I went to this um, like in-person event. It's like a four-day event. You don't have your phone. And uh, one of the big themes is uh, uh, they use this term called uh, I photo. So I focus on the outcome. So it's it's this it's more of a habit than anything, but it's a habit of Anytime you're entering a room with people or going into an interview or blah, 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 like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Sort of just keeping that question top of mind. So per, so for this interview, mine was, there's going to be people watching this. How can I provide value? How can I somehow, maybe even just the smallest way, help change somebody's life, right? And and then you, you feel arrogant, right? Because, you know, how, how could how could I, you know, I'm not even, I'm not even where I want to be, but so going, going from that and then every word I utter, hopefully, unless I'm talking about the matrix, right? Like <laughs> is, is focused on that. So, so that's something they teach and that's more of like a habit and wake, you know, comes to routines, waking up. What do I want to accomplish today? Who do I want to impact today? And using, you know, all of your decisions being guided by mm -hmm. an outcome, sort of always having the outcome and then sort of paradoxically, being present. So not always thinking, am I achieving my goal? Am I achieving my goal? Am I, am I on my way to 10 million? You know, really in um, transcendental meditation, as I know, you know, uh, has helped a lot with this because do you do that still actively every day? 
I do it every day. Um, I think I'm on like a like a 25 or 30 day streak or something. You know, Joseph passed away. I know. That that's who I that's who I first taught me how to meditate. I know. I know. I know. R.I.P. Um, so yeah, sad. keep going. I just that's interesting. I forgot about it, that you did that. And you you reinforced that, and and I think I think you well you referred me to him yeah. actually. So that's big. Um, that helps with focus, and you know uh, you know the study about not multitasking isn't real. You're you're you you switch you just good at switching focus or you know from a high focus task yeah. to a to a low focus tab. But so being, so having outcomes, um, and having it somewhere you can see every day in front of you. Um, and then focusing on being present, uh, especially with individuals, especially when things get emotional mm-hmm. for whatever reason, you know, significant other or, or family or friends or coworkers. Um, how do you say focus on the ups and downs? And then just kind of remembering, like, we don't really matter all that much. No, Stoicism. I, I, I don't yeah. want to, I don't, you know, I don't want to like offend any listeners, but um, I'm a big universe believer and the audacity that some humans have to think that we are, you know, that we are significant. And, and at the same time, we're so significant, right? Like we're, we're part of this small cycle that's inside of a, a bigger cycle that's inside of a bigger, I mean, if, if you don't understand or have looked into or gone down a YouTube you know, rat hole of how big the universe actually is um, to think that your problems are unique or matter that much. Um, great. Another book reference, uh, how to um, the art of not giving a fuck. Don't have the author off the top of my head. And the uh, book, Michael Manson, I think it is. I think you're right. Yep. Yep. I think you're right. Um, it's more about what to give a fuck about. Really, that book. It's a great book. Uh, but you your problems are not that different from anyone else. Um, or any other entrepreneur or person who's doing what you're doing, but yet we all think that they're unique and matter more. So that's a big one too. And remembering like, okay, if I am going to die tomorrow, this doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. What would I do? I call my grandma, call my mom, call you. You might make the list. You know? Yeah. So maybe. that's a good reminder. And it sounds all foo foo, but it's so true. I mean, people die every day, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to die. You don't know when it is. So do your best. Um, and, uh, and just try to keep a high level perspective. Um, principles talks about that a lot too. So there's that. Um, and I, I think at a certain point you have to recognize if what you're doing is bringing misery to your life, um, and realize you can control a lot in your life. So if you're unhappy about something like a job, you are not a victim, like quit your job. Yeah. What will I do? Go work somewhere else. I tell, until I've you convinced, figure it out. I've convinced you know? some of my friends, and they've actually quit their jobs, yeah. and their life got way better. Yeah. So, I'm so. a big. I, that's what I think too. I think don't waste your time doing. Time is the most valuable thing you have. The most. You can't find anything on the planet that's more valuable than time. And if you're gonna use it doing something you don't like to do, you should just not do it. The second you say, or I say, or an individual says, um, "Oh, I just I have to go do this." You are, you are really giving up all of your power and power of now. Another good one. Like Eckhart Tolle talks about, you have the entire universe inside of you. You are a powerful being. We all are incredibly powerful beings. And when you start to say, well, I can't do this because my boss won't let me. It's like, yeah, you can quit your job. Like, (laughs) but just, and, or don't and deal with it, but don't pretend like you don't have a say in this life Mm -hmm. because everybody starts in the same spot. Now, I want to, I want to be clear what I'm what I mean by that. Some people start ten steps ahead, ten steps back. Some people are, you know, especially in this environment, black and have to deal with that. Just had a guy literally fired from a job for, you know, they they made him leave because of the color of his skin. So I don't mean we all start with the same advantages and disadvantages, but we all start with choice, and we can make choices about the organization that we associate ourselves with. Right. Like we went to that customer. We we're going to we're going to tell our boy. Um, I, I don't want to say his name on on the air, but we're going to say, hey, we got your back. And if that happens, we'll get you on another job like that. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. So he can choose to associate with organizations like that or he can choose to go somewhere else that doesn't support him. But at the end of the day, we are all born in the same place, meaning we all are born with sort of the power of choice. Mm-hmm. And the second you start victimizing yourself, 
you're you know you're throwing have you seen it's interesting because that's i i believe in that too and there obviously you can look there's a lot of uh argument to people who don't have choice in certain situations right some people are born in slavery situations or in uh you know i've my development teams in pakistan and it literally constant 100 percent. like constantly there's like they're getting sick, you know, people are dying all the time. Like yeah, his uncle quality. dies, then his dad dies, then his mom dies, then then now his our one of our developers, uh, his dad had just had a heart attack. And it's like just because they're underdeveloped country. Um but if you've ever read the book by Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Um well, no, but I know exactly where you're so going. So he talks about like freedom of the mind and that he was in a concentration camp, but he was a the one thing that they couldn't break was his mind. And so he was able to, even in the worst scenario where he's literally Getting shoveling tortured, like daily, well, he right? would, he would shovel his friend, dead friends and put them in a wheelbarrow and wheel them out and then, you know, dump them. And he was doing stuff like that on a daily basis, like just completely out of this world. And he said the only, what he was able to do is he was able to go up into his head and realize they can't change this up here. And he was teaching people this in there and he kept a, he's fine. He like probably has some ptsd but he's not like <laughs> mentally screwed when he left he was he it was crazy that like, he talks about leaving because they what happened is the war was over and they came and just let everybody out and he was running down a field and he's he was just so out of body experience running around like in these flowers and like but like he was never they never broke his his mind and so he was able to stay alive in there and when he got out like he says he he wrote a whole book about just like how you what's you, it called again my my mentor, who you, who we were talking about earlier, recommended this to me too, and I haven't picked it up yet. I'll I can look it out. Put, put it the title you. of the book at, at at the bottom of the screen. But yeah, that's yeah. A, yeah. So piece one. Yeah. So it's. I guess the that's always my my um my argument too. When you say like everybody has a choice, I think it comes back to everybody has a choice to be a victim in their head or not. And you don't have necessarily a choice in your circumstances outside in the physical world because we, you know, the world is the world. There's a lot of um, unfairness that happens in the world, but you you can choose in your head how you deal with that. And I think that's especially talking about Eckhart Tolle coming in like the power of now, like really what matters is inside you. The external world is so doesn't matter, you know, it's everything. And you got to be so careful when we talk about this, because like you said, there's just a, a sickening, sad amount of injustices going on on this planet. And so when you tell people that, you know, people get angry and rightfully so if they're not if they're not understanding really what you're trying to say, that these authors who, you know, have spent their lives in concentration camps have and spent, you know, hours and hours writing novels to sort of convey we can't do that on a on a yeah. show like this. So it's important to be sensitive because it's not it's it's not a it's not like a really simple concept to grasp, but at the end of the day, yes, like to your point, it's can you find peace up here? Because at the end of the day, your happiness doesn't isn't rely on your external circumstances. Can you can you be okay with where you're at in the universe? And sometimes it ends in what would, you know, from an outside perspective, be a really sad way. And that and that's just is true about our earth and our and our world, unfortunately. But that's a great book, Power Now. It really talks about getting inside and. and it is. I'm going to reread it. I think getting I started into being. the other day. All right. You read that, and then I got to read Victor Frankel, read Frankel's, whatever it is. Frankel's. Uh, yeah. So that's the last question. Um, Before we go here. Nice to end on something light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna end on something else. I want you to say something to the viewers. Uh, what one thing will you leave them with? Think about it, and then say, you know, you had a purpose coming in here. You said you wanted to, you wanted to have. Um, then mow me five grand. I'll get you in the next real estate deal. I can't. No, no, get something serious. Um, and we can do another one of these, so it doesn't have to be that serious. <laughs> Take care of the relationships in your life. Uh, they are all that matter. That's good. That's cool. what I'm leaving. All right, cool. Well, yeah, that's the show. Um, we'll catch you next time. We'll cut it there. I do want to do another intro. Hello. Can we what do? You like can we, I just think now that you broke, we've broken in. I think we should do intros. At the, I'm wondering if we do intros. I don't know how we want to do this, but I'm just.